Good evening and a very warm welcome to First Issues. Botswana produces the bulk of its electricity from coal. The great news is that the country has estimated coal deposits of 212 billion tons, which if proven would make Botswana one of the largest producers of coal. And also means that the country, this one country, has over two thirds of the continent's coal. Botswana also happens to enjoy over 3,200 hours of sunshine per year, making it perfect for the production of solar energy. Despite this, the Botswana Investment and Trade Center, BITC, says only 22% of the country's population has access to electricity, contradicting Botswana Power Corporation's figures of 79.63% of households benefiting from electricity. Also, more than half of Botswana's power is imported from South Africa and Zambia, and electricity tariffs in the country are the highest in the region. Efforts to expand the country's electricity production capabilities through Murupilebi Power Station have been riddled with highly publicized challenges. By 2014, the project is reported to have cost Botswana taxpayers an estimated 17 billion bula, which would make it the most expensive project ever undertaken in this country. Despite this expense, there were reports last year that the 600 megawatt Murupulebi power station was only operating at 21% capacity, producing only 130 megawatts of power. As we speak, government negotiations to sell the troubled power plant should be coming to a close in the next few months. What does all this mean for Botswana in the short, medium and long term? Should consumers be bracing themselves for renewed interruptions in power supply? Should businesses prepare themselves for the operational challenges that brought many, especially small businesses, to their knees a few years ago? This is what some small businesses went through in 2014. about 50,000. This is and some of them 40,000. balance. Quick <laughs> Tell me, I have the implications of renewed power cuts would be far reaching. Should those mandated to sell Botswana as a destination of choice for doing business brace themselves for difficult questions from potential investors? Tonight we bring you the answers to all these questions directly from the BPC CEO, Dr. Stefan Swasfischer. Follow this discussion after the break. Should the public brace itself for renewed interruptions in power supply? Should businesses prepare themselves for the operational challenges that brought many, especially small businesses, to their knees? 
Tonight we bring you the answers to all these questions directly from the BPC CEO, Dr. Stefan Swazfischer. I fully understand the excitement in the market and in the community because BPC didn't always deliver like it should deliver in the past. But the demand peak right now, um, today it was 49 megawatt per kilowatt hour. And we've got three units running right now at Marupoli B. So that covers mostly 94% um, of the demand. And the additional demand actually we buy uh, from external markets like South Africa or the sub-market. And we just recently renegotiated the South African contract with ESCOM in order to provide Botswana with cheaper power on a non-firm basis, which helps Botswana right now extreme to overcome cost hurdles uh, when it comes to import. So it is looking good. You so do it look, not anticipate any no, challenges, we, no, no load limiting, no load shedding no. in that's, the months to come. That, that, that shouldn't be a problem. There shouldn't be a short, uh, um, load shading um, in the future. Um, and no outages um, right now we are doing fine and we did quite fine during the last months so I assume it will continue like that during the whole winter season. What then is responsible for the outages we have experienced in the past few weeks? When it comes to outages during the last week it was not a generation problem or capacity problem um, especially when it came to um, to uh, the season where Dineo actually ran over Botswana, for example, and we, 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 we faced a lot of rain. Uh, this rain is actually causing some trouble uh, within our distribution network. And then we've got failures within our distribution network. And then one or the other transformer is actually switching off. And because of that, we have got that failure. But when it comes to capacity issues, right now we don't have an issue um, on load shading. And speaking of Murupule B, um, how is the operational output at this stage um, relative to what was anticipated at this particular time? Three units of the four units we have in Rupoli B uh, right now are running. And the fourth one is scheduled to come to line on the 16th of, of June. We are just doing some maintenance and we, we, we had some difficulties on the maintenance there. But that was solved actually now over the weekend. Uh, so we are happy to say that this unit is going back to life on the 16th of June, June and then we've got four units running. I think during the last six months both, all four units were running quite well. Nevertheless, to answer your question correctly, um, one needs to state that the availability of the plant is not at the stage where it's supposed to be. So that means if all four units running, they are running at 100%. But right now we've got an availability of 72% and it should be somewhere between 85 or 87%. So we are still struggling a little bit on that one, but nevertheless we are increasing now our rem remediation efforts to improve that situation on short notice. And with the constructing company um, CNEC, we progressed or let's say, developed a timetable now to overcome that hurdles. But the main hurdles on that one will now, to, to, to accomplish that target, will now take probably for another three to four, month, four years actually to overcome that because we need to replace uh, one unit after another for the next four years. So they need to be completely replaced? We don't need to replace them completely, but the, I would call it the heart of each boiler, which is a high pressure part, these parts need to be replaced completely and unfortunately for each unit that, that uh, needs 12 months. There is talk of uh, Murubile B being sold, however. Um, how far along is that process and what are the implications of Murubile B being sold? Well, I think it's public record that or notice that uh, Murubile B is going to be sold. There was a cabinet decision um, that in forced this um, process and right now uh, we are actually in the middle of the tender process so we are going for a selective tender process um, where we first start negotiations with one preferred bidder and once these negotiations have been concluded uh, which probably should be somewhere in July this year 
um, then both parties can go into um, their proceedings. Like we need to have, from BPC point of view, we need to have board approval, we need to have ministry approval, we need to have cabinet approval and probably parliament approval um, in order to proceed. And the other party actually needs to do the same. So that means from a process point of view, we are then expecting um, the handover of Moropoli B probably in January 2018 to happen. What will the sale mean for uh, the average consumer, for Murubile B to now be an independent power producer after it's been sold? I think that the average consumer will not notice the handover because the power will be dispatched as it was dispatched in the past. Probably the availability will be a little bit higher over the next four years because the remediation st uh, still needs to take place, um, even under the new owner. Um, the prices will stay the same. Um, it doesn't matter if it's BPC running the, the, the power plant or if it's the, if it's the new owner. Um, from a financial point of view, as the loans within um, our balance sheet of, B, uh, of Morupli B are quite a huge burden for the company, um, it, this sale will support BPC in order to overcome um, its financial problems. To a lay person, there appears to be more than enough sunshine for Botswana to aspire to getting the bulk of its electricity through solar power. Are these thoughts misplaced? Is there something that we may be failing to grasp? What we decided on is uh, now to, to, to make a challenge. And in order to make that challenge now, um, probably, I'm not quite sure if you're aware of it, uh, BPC now tendered for a 100 megawatt solar power plant which is quite a huge power plant in its, in its size. Normally you, you do this kind of st um, project step by step in order to achieve 1%, 2%, 3% or then 15 to 20% of solar power plant or green energy within a community or an environment. Um, now as, as we are a little bit behind um, compared to, to other, other countries in Southern Africa, um, we make a huge step forward with 100 megawatt um, and to give it a huge share um, within our power mix um, in the future. So hopefully then in, in the beginning of next year we will see the first solar panels um, in Botswana um, in a huger scale um, uh, than we see them right now because the only power plant we have right now is a 1.3 megawatt solar power plant in, a, in, in the area of Pakalani. Uh, but the 100 megawatt will be definitely a bigger project for all of us. That comes back to your original question. Why didn't we encourage solar at the first place, but probably stick to cold fire power plants um, in, in, in the previous years? I think the, the answer um, can be found, I would call it, in our demand curve over, over the 24 hours. Within 24 hours, we need to provide electricity. And coal-fired power plants are quite reliable when it comes to performance because they deliver 24 hours. Unfortunately, the sun only delivers powers, power between 6 o'clock in the morning and 6 o'clock in the afternoon. And when you look at the load that you can get or uh, dispatch out of a solar power plant, actually you, the most of the, the power you get somewhere between 11 o'clock in the morning and two or three o'clock in the afternoon. This is the peak time for a solar power plant where you get the 100 megawatt. Mm -hmm. And because of that, the efficiency of a 100 megawatt solar power plant is only 30% compared to probably something about 80 to 90% efficiency within a cold fire power plant. So it is quite low. But on the other hand, as you know, the sun is for free. Um, so we now need to, just need to adapt our, I would call the control of power, to that new situation and environment. So 100% renewable energy is nowhere near in sight for us? I would call it like this. So not, 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 not even, I would call it Europe or America um, has a achieved that objective. There's one country in Europe which tried to achieve that objective, but it is quite hard. And you actually need, to, in order to achieve that, you need to mix the different green energy sources, which are in general water, uh, wind, and solar or biomass. 
Um, so we don't have a lot of wind here, so there's, it's no use in putting wind plants on the ground. We don't have any water, as you know, um, or not at least not enough to run a power plant. Um, so solar is the only option we've got. So that means at the final end, I think the, the, the technical limit will be somewhere at 30 percent um, that can be achieved in the future. Welcome back to First Issues. On the 1st of April 2017, various stakeholders were given 12 months to comply with the new Retirement Fund Regulations of 2016. This was seen as a necessary measure to better manage pensions in increasingly unstable and complex economic times. The regulations are the final step in enacting Parliament's decision in 2014 to repeal the Pension and Provident Funds Act of 1987 and reenact it under a new name, the Retirement Funds Act. This empowers the Non-Bank Financial Institutions Regulatory Authority, NBFIRA, to exercise better supervision over retirement funds in terms of risk-based oversight, investment of fund assets, transparency of funds to members, participation by members in the affairs of the funds, and clear requirements for trustees and management of fund contributions. The bill includes the provision that ensures that investments are approved and guarded by the NBFIRA in a way that protects members' interests. What do these new regulations mean for everyone involved, especially those of us who hand over our money month after month, hoping that those we entrusted to keep and grow it fairly, keeping our best interests at heart, and that we will have something to eat in our older ages in the future when we can no longer be gainfully employed? Jeremy Andrew, a consulting actuary from South Africa who has been part of efforts stemming from the World Bank to improve the regional regulation of retirement funds and has consulted on the new regulations to be enacted locally, tells us where these new regulations place Botswana relative to other nations in terms of retirement fund regulations, how he thinks we compare. It's certainly a bit ahead of South Africa because uh, what we've tried to do, and if, if I look across at places like Namibia and so on that I was also familiar with, I think it puts it actually at the forefront. It's, it's addressing certain areas, amongst others, where there are gaps and so on in the others, and, and those gaps have been filled here. Um, not necessarily onerous ones, but for example, trying to make the distribution of death benefits easier for trustees, because it's now asking that members have beneficiary nomination forms and that the trustees can then under, um, if they feel that that distribution is reasonable, it's been motivated, they can accept that. They don't have to replace it. So it's hopefully going to make some of the processes easier for trustees. What would you say the main stipulations in these new regulations are? Well, the Act said in a number of clauses, um, as prescribed by um, and that's the new regulations are addressing nearly all of those areas. The only ones that are left really to be dealt with by prudential rules to be issued by NBFIRA um, are d dealing with the investments, the maximum limits on investments, um, certain matters to do with what an actually has to put in their reports and so on. But other than that, um, the new regulations have replaced, in fact, I think, much of what is currently in prudential rules. Should we then assume that it should be an easy and straightforward implementation of these new regulations based on what is currently being practiced or not? I would hope so, but the, the uh, regulator, um, uh, Ms. Sokov, um, actually spoke and I suspect from that we've got a bit of learning to do still, a bit of implementation to do still. Mm. But there shouldn't be any really big surprises. Um, I didn't see any in going through the new regulations. What does this mean um, for 
uh, those that oversee pension funds. Uh, we're talking, of course, about trustees and administrators. Oh, what do they really need to take away from uh, workshops such as this and the changes that have been made? Compliance is becoming more serious. It's not that the degree of compliance they're being asked to do is very different from what they were being asked to do in terms of the prudential rules. But now um, that's really a matter of, of subordinate legislation under the Act. And there we've got a, um, some definite new compliance issues. And of course, essentially, what does this mean for every Motswana who is trusting that their pension will see them out through retirement? I think that the governance structure and the looking at trying to make sure that trustees manage funds in the best interests of members, that is really being reinforced in these regulations. Um, I don't think it's trustees are being asked to do anything they shouldn't have been doing, but it's just putting in regulations. These are the things you have to do. There's going to be someone who's going to be assessing your performance once a year. They're going to check out that you're doing all these things. So it should just improve the level of compliance. If you were to go by stakeholder and say that these regulations mean this for the trustee, they mean this for the administrator, um, do you have main points, I think, um, in summary that you could pick from them? For a trustee, um, nothing has really changed, but they've added a couple of things. They want the trustees to act independently of whatever constituency has put them there. Um, they want them to act without taking account of, of matters that are inappropriate. So they've spelt a few things like that out, but no real change. For an administrator, um, the licensing, a, a lot of the documentation that's got to go with licensing has been tightened. They've spelt out additional criteria if you want to license an umbrella fund, as you call it here, or funds where a number of different employers will come in with their employees. They've, they've fleshed out the, what is required much more. I don't think there's anything threatening there. All in all then, this is a positive development um, for all um, that should uh, be implemented smoothly and puts Botswana a little above the curve in terms of retirement. I believe so, yes. Seeing that regulations are now in place to help you better participate in the affairs of your retirement fund, we here at First Issues will also do our part by introducing you to the various stakeholders involved in the management of your money, beginning next week by clarifying the role of the trustee. With that, it is good night from me, Namizo Samakula, and the First Issues team.